Okay. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to our Wednesday industry conversation of the Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action. And this session is really to continue the conversation we started um, just about an hour ago about the various uh, work that healthcare professionals and healthcare organizations are doing to advance renewable energy and the intersection with climate. Um, our host for this session is Dr. Andrew Lewandowski, um, and I'll turn this completely over to him and um, let you take it away, Andrew. Sure. So welcome everybody, everybody, and thank you for joining the industry conversation today. And I think what we'll do, since there aren't too many of us, we'll just start off with some introductions. Um, and really my goal of uh, this session today is to be able to answer questions and make sure people understand what our organization is, what we can do, or in general, what healthcare um, can do to help further the conversation about renewables or climate change and, and human health. Because I think it's, um, it's definitely a field that has expanded as far as um, research and publications, especially in the last five years, um, even if there has been stuff that's been going on for a longer period of time. But it's just a great time frame um, to really be pushing the, the message on, on healthcare and um, climate change and human health and the benefits from that. So, um, but let's go ahead and get started. My goal really is more to answer questions that you all have or for us to have a good conversation. I don't have any slides that I need to present or um, I can certainly pull in slides if we need to, to, to reference things, but um, especially post, uh, Heather and I were joking that post lunch, it's uh, kind of nice just to, just to be able to have a conversation instead of looking at slides all the time. So um, I am Andrew Lewandowski and I'm a pediatrician on the east side of Madison. And I am on the board for Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action. Um, if you were in Claire Gervais session, Dr. Gervais is also um, and the Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action. Um, and she is the secretary treasurer for the organization. And I'm also the co-chair uh, of education for, um, for uh, that organization. So that is kind of my role with Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action. Um, I've also served with a number of other groups. I know many of us get pulled into different organizations or, or groups uh, for, for a number of things. Um, but instead of going into all that, let's just maybe hear from everyone else. Um, so uh, we can just go down the list. Uh, on, on my screen, I have tech support. If our tech support host wants to introduce themselves or if you have any announcements, uh, I certainly wouldn't want to leave you out. You're probably one of the most important people here. Hello, um, I'll be your tech support. Feel free to message me privately if you have any tech issues or questions or concerns, um, but otherwise leave the chat open for the webinar. Thanks, guys. And tech support, you are more than welcome to ask questions about healthcare and renewables as well. It does not bother me one bit. Um, Heather? Hi there, I'm Heather Allen, Executive Director of Renew Wisconsin, and excited to be talking about energy and health. Great. Allie? Hi there. I'm Allie Wolf. I'm the system director for Spiros Health. Um, I'm excited to learn more about this uh, platform. I uh, see emails coming into my inbox that I am not very timely with. And uh, we have 8,700 employees that um, I'm looking to identify how to plug into things uh, across our health system. So anxious just to learn. Great, thank you. Brittany. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Brittany Keys. I'm a physical therapist practicing in Beloit, Wisconsin. And I'm also on the board of Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action and serve as co-chair for the Advocacy and Policy um, Committee. And another hat that I wear is I am uh, about nine months in my first term as a city councilor in Beloit. So I've really appreciated the other sessions today and I'm excited to hear about potential growth uh, that we can have here in Wisconsin. Great, thank you, Brittany. Chris. Hi, um, I'm Chris Hubbock. I'm a reporter for the Wisconsin State Journal. I cover energy and the environment. 
Great, thank you. And just for people who have been joining recently, we're just going through it, especially given that we're in a small group format. I'm um, just introducing ourselves, however you feel comfortable introducing yourself, and then uh, we'll go into an organic conversation about uh, climate and health and uh, Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action and things that we're doing to, to try and advance the conversation around renewables and, and other climate justice strategies. Um, Dean. Hello, everybody. Glad to be here. Uh, Dean Makeham said I'm in the Triple Falls area in Wisconsin. Uh, I'm a solar consultant uh, working with Carlson Electric out of Hayward. Uh, also, I, I have a, another part of my business, I guess, that's dealing with uh, maybe not healthcare, but my wife is in the Marshfield uh, Clinic um, for the last 30 years or so. And uh, I'd love to get involved with the folks over at Marshfield and, and see what we can do to improve the quality of their power and energy and, and give them some options. So that's what brought me to this uh, location. And another part of my business is uh, dealing with sustainable, eco-friendly home solutions, uh, one being RoofMax. Uh, RoofMax is a soybean-based product that uh, we're putting on asphalt roofs to improve the um, sustainability of an asphalt roof. So kind of off the subject, but uh, uh, my company is interested in sustainability and how do we improve for our future? Thanks. Great. Thank you, Dean. And I just want to reiterate uh, so a phrase that we say all the time is climate solutions are health solutions. So in, in my mind, whatever you're putting on that asphalt roof, um, assuming that it's environmentally responsible in and of itself, I mean, that that absolutely ties into um, into healthcare. If we can um, save CO2 by, uh, by keeping the, the shingles that are existing on your roof now, instead of putting them into landfills, that's, uh, that's our focus, absolutely. Absolutely, and I have two Jeffs um, in the gallery right now. Jeff Thompson is listed first on my list. So go ahead, Jeff Thompson. Hi, I'm Jeff Thompson. I'm a pediatrician, former CEO of the Gunderson Health System. Been fairly active in uh, environmental issues and healthcare for a while. I'm currently the co-board chair of Healthcare Without Harm, uh, which is uh, the largest international organization trying to coordinate the efforts across the continents in regards to healthcare, their responsibility and their opportunity to uh, lead in improving health and improving our climate. Great, thank you, Jeff. And Jeff Rich. Hi, everyone, I'm Jeff Rich. I, uh, I did work with uh, Dr. Thompson at Gunderson. Hi, Jeff. And uh, did a lot of work on the uh, environment and energy uh, for a while. I'm, I'm retired now, but I, I serve on the Renew Wisconsin board and uh, also worked with uh, Andrew this summer on the governor's uh, uh, climate change task force a little bit. I serve on um, uh, uh, UW Platteville board advisory board for their uh, sustainable renewable energy systems major as well. So thank you. Great, and for anyone joining us, we're just going around and introducing ourselves, however um, you feel comfortable and would like to, and then we'll follow that up by a, a conversation about um, climate change and health and renewables in our organization, Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action. Um, I have Kim Griffin. Kim? Hi, I'm Kim Griffin. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm in central Wisconsin. I am the local representative for the Wood County Solar Project. Um, I also work at Photovoltaic Systems, a solar installer. I'm just here because I would like to know more about the health benefits. Great. Um, Katie. Hey, everybody. Um, Katie Wickman. Um, I work for Advocate Rural Health and um, am part of the Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action and am here to always glean more from my colleagues and um, learn a little bit more about what others outside of healthcare are most interested to know. Great. Tony? Hi, I'm uh, Tony Crow with uh, SCS Engineers. Uh, we've lately been providing some retro commissioning services for some VA hospitals and uh, we've also done some solar feasibility studies for um, our landfills uh, located here at Dane County Landfill. Uh, we've been involved with that on some some different avenues too. So uh, looking, for enjoying, looking forward to enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tony. And I 
think that is everybody. The names kind of always jump up and down the list. So um, if anyone else joins, we can have them introduce themselves too. Um, but in general, uh, if I know that people have differing feelings about talking versus entering things in chat, I'll be monitoring both. And so if you would rather not speak up or do want to speak up, or if you'd rather post something in the chat, either one is fine if you have questions or if you have general topics that you want to cover or go into. Um, I enjoy seeing people's faces, but I will not be offended if you guys turn off videos. Um, and then obviously muting ourselves so that we don't have any feedback issues is um, also helpful. But um, does anybody have any questions or topics that they wanted to start off talking about? I have a question. Go for it, Heather. Um, I'm not sure we, we, we dealt, and this is for everybody who's on the Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action. Um, we just barely touched on the, the work you're doing and how that organization got started. I'm kind of wondering if, if, if you all want to tell us how Wisconsin Health Professionals came together and what you're up to and where you're going. Yeah, absolutely, we can do that. So um, Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action started about two Junes ago. Um, uh, our current chair, Sharantan um, Mukhopadhyay, he uh, is out in um, out in Milwaukee. Unfortunately, he's actually going to to um, be part of a fellowship at, in Iowa City soon, so he'll be he'll be he'll be leaving the state. But um, we'll still obviously be in touch with him. Um, but he had talked to a group called the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, um, and MSCCH is led by um, a relatively um, a relatively strong group of um, physicians in climate and health. So some pretty big names within climate and health um, really founded that group. And now they have a number of state affiliates. And one of them, uh, one of the leaders, Mark Mitchell, his job is to kind of work on starting up a uh, different um, clinician for climate action uh, state groups or state affiliates so that, you know, obviously the goal being that we could have um, healthcare climate advocates or health climate advocates um, in pretty much every state um, with organized efforts to send the message out about um, the role of climate change and its effects on human health and ways that we can um, equitably um, mitigate and adapt to climate change. Um, and so Sharantan had initial conversations with um, Dr. Mark Mitchell and then Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action formed. And um, initially it was just a, a relatively small group of individuals who um, got a chance to talk to each other. And then on one of our, um, one of our board um, conversations, we said, well, we should really have a, a continuing medical education event where we can invite people. Um, and for some reason, we decided to throw one together in the span of two months, um, which was a little bit of a heavy lift, but it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. We got a lot of good, uh, a lot of um, good conversation as a result of the conference. Um, the Lieutenant Governor was there um, and he gave a, a short speech um, about the importance of of climate change and uh, climate change mitigation and health. And so um, after that, you know, really in the last one and a half years, our membership has exploded and is over 250 members, um, healthcare professionals around the state. Um, and I, we say healthcare professionals, Wisconsin health professionals, because it isn't just doctors. Um, I mean, I'm a doctor, but we have, um, you know, I'm a pediatrician. We have Brittany, who's a, a doctor of physical therapy. Um, we have um, nurses and other healthcare professionals. And really, one really, uh, the, this group is for healthcare as a whole. I um, mean, so that's really kind of where things came out of. And we also uh, partner with a number of other organizations. Um, obviously, Renew Wisconsin is um, one of our partners. We've been, uh, you know, sharing. Um, uh, just having conversations with over the last um, the last year and a half and and forming those partnerships has been really helpful because we know that climate change mitigation and adaptation is a multidisciplinary uh, multidisciplinary problem that requires multidisciplinary solutions. So not everyone has the answer for everything. So that is kind of where we came from. Um, as far as where we're going, we have uh, a number of committees. We have, uh, so Brittany Keys, who introduced herself earlier, Brittany Keys is our um, one of our um, policy and advocacy co-chairs, and so we have um, Brittany. Maybe I'll let you talk a little bit more about the the policy and advocacy committee and kind of your your goals. 
Absolutely. So um, for our committee, it's pushing um, and supporting meaningful uh, climate policy um, to benefit the health of our patients and the people of Wisconsin. Um, and right now we're looking to see what we can impact uh, largely at the state levels, the focus now. Um, and we uh, have had quite a bit of success um, uh, reaching out to um, different um, stakeholders as well as representatives. We just had a meeting today actually with three representatives um, just uh, talking about the direction of, of where we can go, how we can best support them, um, and and really laying the groundwork for how we can be best, uh, most effective in, in promoting policy, um, passing maybe this this year, this budget cycle, this biennium, and then as well as looking longer term. Um, and then uh, in the next breath, looking to at local, um, uh, the local governments. Um, and so we are a smaller group right now. So we are keeping in mind our limitations of manpower and time, um, but it's pretty exciting. Um, everything that we've been able to accomplish in, in basically about a year's time. Thank you, Brittany. Um, I'm the co-chair for education at Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action. And so our group is, um, and it's actually kind of a combination, it's media empowerment and education is the full um, title of that committee, but it's education of anyone and everyone who's who's interested in learning. So um, how do we get to teach medical students and residents and people who are in training to become healthcare professionals, but how do we educate the public? How can we get the message out to um, other individuals? And obviously there's a specific focus on that with policymakers within our policy and advocacy committee. Um, but we know that education about the effects of climate and health is something that's a, a nonpartisan issue. Um, it affects us all regardless of our background and regardless of, of um, kind of where we're coming from. And then we also have a, um, some, of the, some of the committees have changed their names over time, but we essentially have a decarbonizing Wisconsin healthcare group. Um, so that group is working to uh, make sure that we're not too hypocritical. We know that 10% of the uh, emissions from our country come from the US healthcare system. And so what can we do to reduce um, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, reduce environmental impact? And obviously um, with Jeff Rich and Jeff Thompson um, in, this, in this group, they've already done a great job. And Katie at Advocate Aurora, I know that's something that their group is actively doing. And Allie Wolf as well up in Aspirus. It's great having, um, having people like them with us um, to, to work through those sorts of things. And so that committee is working to connect individuals and help with that networking. And if there are resources that can be provided, um, with respect to sharing their, our successes and sharing our failures too. Sometimes we learn from the stuff that doesn't work, um, more so than the stuff that more than more so than the stuff that does. Um, and then we have a direct action committee and the direct action committee, um, is essentially, uh, a number of, different things. It's kind of what can we do right now to try and get stuff done about a specific initiative um, or, you know, sometimes we can almost use it as like a, a study hall for everybody. Let's get together and write some LTEs or some op-eds that we can get posted um, to local newspapers or online blogs. Um, there, it's, it's kind of an other duties as a sign to try and just get some, get stuff done. Um, and then lastly, and I, I struggle with talking about this as its standalone committee because it's not so much a, a committee as much as um, more like oversight of our entire organization, but we do have an anti-racism committee as well. Um, and so making sure that everything that we do um, uses more than an equity lens, but more is just having all of these principles of anti-racism and social justice incorporated into um, what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, um, the reason I say I struggle with talking about it as its committee is it's not necessarily just that it's this one standalone committee, but I really like to think about Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action, um, not as a, a climate change and health organization, but really as a climate justice organization or an, or an environmental justice organization. Um, and that outlook, I think, is so important, um, especially especially in our state for a number of reasons. And so we really try to incorporate that into to everything we do rather than it being just a standalone committee. Um, but that committee does work on, um, you know, education of people within our uh, within our 
uh, association, but also education of people at large, but then also something that they've been interested in is reaching out to uh, public health officials and other local governments or institutions within local government um, to say, hey, what are some of the things that you're seeing within your community that you're concerned about? We know that um, public health solutions generally are best when they come from those communities rather than trying to say, oh, this is what we think is going to be helpful for you. It's more of a tell us what you think would be useful for you and, and how can we try and dovetail in climate mitigation and adaptation efforts in an, in an equitable way. So um, those are the primary committees. I believe I got them all. Did I miss any? Anybody miss any? I think that's all of them. So questions about any of those committees or did that stir up any questions that you have about um, healthcare messaging or ways that our group could partner with your organizations or things like that? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have um, any kind of content or framework that um, I could drop staff into and have them sort of navigate? I, I guess I'm trying to figure out if I was to point staff toward this group, um, given the four committees that you just walked us through, it sounded like there was a direct action committee. I'm curious if that is what you would recommend or how do I, my fear is, is if I point them towards the group and it's not something that's tangible, actionable, they'll move on and that's not what you're intending and certainly not what they were looking for. So what would be the best way to, to in, make that engagement uh, beneficial for both parties? Great question. So um, I'll maybe generally interpret that as what are some ways that we can partner or get involved with our organization? And if people are interested in joining the organization, they're certainly welcome to do so. You can go to the website, which I think is um, posted somewhere in the chat. Um, and then that'll get you onto our email list so that you can get more involved. Um, we have monthly um, we have monthly meetings for each of the committees, um, including the anti-racism committee. Um, and so you can certainly join any of those meetings. If you have specific asks, um, our executive director, Abby Lois, she can um, certainly uh, talk about partnering on specific initiatives or if there are specific questions about things that you are doing and how that could dovetail with some of the stuff that we're doing or, if, uh, you know, many, much of what we do also involves networking with other people. So if we don't have the answer for something, but we know somebody who do because who does because they're part of our membership or we've heard of those experiences, sometimes taking advantage of that can also be helpful. So even if we don't have the answer, kind of forwarding that on to somebody. So, you know, if Aspirus has an initiative that they're working on and um, they're looking for some, some feedback or to see if someone else has done that, we would be happy to, to try and point people in the, the right direction if we have some knowledge around that. Um, does that answer your question, Ellie? Yeah, it's great. Thank you. Just to, just to build on that, Andrew, are, are you all planning another continuing education conference? I thought so that was that really is, useful. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So actually at the end of this month, um, we have like a WHPCA board strategy retreat where we're going to be getting together for an eight hour Zoom meeting. And so we'll be outlining some of our goals for the next year. So I can't um, speak to exactly what we'll be doing, but I absolutely know that continuing medical education and conferences are things that we plan to, to do on an ongoing basis, but I don't have any details for that yet. Um, they would certainly be part of any of the mailing lists that we, in any of the mailing lists that we do or part of our newsletters. Um, and so if you'd like to keep abreast of those sorts of things, um, I would just uh, sign up for that. And then hopefully it's not just one more email to delete throughout the course of the day. Andrew, this is Jeff. Um, mm -hmm. Last night on the uh, conversation with the steering group that's working on that, um, the plan was in the next two weeks, to, we've talked about it for some time, to bring a proposal to that meeting you're talking about in two weeks uh, for an April um, online conference this year, this, this April, 2021. And so that the date, the hard date hasn't been set. The general season of April thought would be good. Um, an outline of people that might speak um, and how we might gather and promote it has been worked on. Uh, the rough draft came out today. Um, so I think by the time you get to your meeting, it'll be refined a bit. Uh, and then hoping your group can um, 
you know, improve on it um, and uh, make suggestions. And then probably this year, April, um, some form of gathering will occur. That's great. Thank you for that update, Jeff. Um, I know right now, um, speaking to continuing medical education or CME, um, the Great Lakes webinar series, there's a Great Lakes webinar series on climate and health that's going on right now. And it involves um, efforts from groups in Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, um, Ohio, and Illinois. Um, and Wisconsin has a seminar that they're putting on um, kind of in conjunction uh, with, I think it's Minnesota, no, with Michigan. Um, we'll be talking this month. There will be another set of speakers in um, February, March, and April as well. So that'll be um, some monthly continuing medical education where we're sharing information about climate and health in uh, different areas, whether it's you know agriculture, or renewables, or um, climate and health in general. There are a number of other topics. So if you're looking for something right now, um, the Great Lakes webinar series will be starting this month and going through the next few months. And um, and then Jeff mentioned, it sounds like we'll have some things coming down the pipe that we'll make people aware of. And to temper expectations for April, the current ideation from the group was a one hour conference. So maybe more like webinar um, with the main um, intended audience for um, healthcare hospital senior leadership, but open to others as well. But the audience would be kind of like, um, focused on engaging healthcare leadership and joining um, kind of other folks within Wisconsin healthcare organizations toward climate action. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, and I see a question from Jeff in the chat and it says, how can we mobilize engagement better as a healthcare community in the permitting or an approval for various clean energy projects within the state? And um, then it says the healthcare institutions or professionals carry a lot of weight with their voice, but health systems tend to shy away from engaging in any activism on local projects that might affect their communities. Um, that's kind of a multifaceted question. Um, and this is meant to be a, a conversation as well. So if other people want to share, it doesn't have to be me talking the whole time. Um, but there are lots of things that are there within that question. Um, one is, Jeff is absolutely right. They've done um, Gallup polls of uh, different, um, I think it was Gallup, there have been polls done about uh, who's the, who are the most trusted professionals um, in society, and uh, nurses almost always rank near the top. Doctors, we're a little bit farther behind. We trust our nurses more than our doctors, um, and other healthcare professionals are high up on the list. Not surprisingly, we see that lawyers and politicians, who unfortunately are responsible for trying to make some of these changes, are, are towards, the, towards the bottom of the list on, on trusted professionals um, for, um, for different initiatives. But absolutely, that's something that is important. And there have been a number of instances in the past uh, year, especially where um, if there is a solar farm that's being um, you know, developed or if there's a, a wind farm that people are looking at developing, um, and there are obviously a number of different permitting processes, processes that, ha that people have to go through, or there are um, you know, community group sessions with uh, either community leaders or concerned citizens or things like that. Um, those are ways that we weigh in as health professionals. And we say, hey, look, we're here, for, um, we're, we're here for our patients. We're here for your community. We understand that there are concerns. Um, but telling people why this is a really important issue and why climate mitigation and adaptation is a crucial part of um, ensuring the health of not only um, ourselves from immediate co-benefits, but also future generations um, our children and their children and, and their children after them um, is a very powerful message. And it's a nonpartisan message. And it's a very sincere message coming from the health professionals who are concerned about these things. We've written letters to um, the board, uh, Heather and our organization, the Wisconsin Environmental Health Network, um, other groups, I think the American Lung Association, and there was one other, Heather, I can't remember. We, we, we sent a letter to the Public Service Commission um, for a, a different project as well, the Paris Solar Farm. Well, yeah, um, WHPCA, the Wisconsin Environmental Health Network, um, American Lung Association of Wisconsin, even the Asthma Coalition of Wisconsin have all signed letters of support for utility of scale renewable projects, which is super helpful for um, the commission to get that perspective, the Public Service Commission. I actually think we should turn, turn to Kim Griffin here, who, as she mentioned, um, was instrumental in the work to support the Wood County Solar Farm 
And I know that you found that voice very useful. Would you weigh in a little bit on that? Yeah, so um, as a local rep, part of my job is kind of gathering those letters that go in the docket a little bit. Um, and for my project, I looked through a couple of the other dockets and saw the parasolar one and the letter in there is just phenomenal from the healthcare workers, which is great. Um, and it's really helpful for not only for the PSC to see that, but I know like our docket, a lot of the local people are following that as well to see what goes in and what goes out. And so it helps locally for people to see how much that affects our healthcare as well. So it was really helpful to get that in their docket. It was really nice to have it in ours. So thank you so much for your work on that. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, I, I think that, that that element of it is, is so important. I, I, I wanna thank, thank Jeff for bringing it up because um, it, it's important with decision makers and it's important with the public, that perspective of a healthcare leader talking about why renewable reason, energy. And part of the reason I asked the question, I know Andrew and I have attended some, you know, community uh, permitting meetings and so forth for a wind site a year ago. And Heather, I see it on the renew board, how often this comes up. A lot of these projects can be killed at the local level. And, you know, and we're worried as healthcare is our mission about improving health for the community. So part of that is you know, what investments are we making in our communities that actually impact that health? Yet, it's often difficult for a healthcare institution to, to come out and say something or get involved with this. It seems like there's a lot of hesitancy there. And we certainly can make an impact as individuals or try our best, but how do we more unify that voice somehow? And, uh, and, and get that utility scale project and um, you know, sometimes they can run into trouble too. So, and, and maybe there needs to be a set of criteria. Not all projects are equal. There are some things I would support and other things I wouldn't, but um, it seems like uh, that would be a, a niche that, you know, our healthcare professionals could certainly help with as we think about, you know, changing the landscape and this whole thing. I might step in just um, and comment a minute that the, especially the policy and advocacy committee, um, we're looking for opportunities at the local level, um, you know, municipal, county level. Um, we've we've had uh, we we spoke. Um, uh, was it line about line five and testifying um, earlier this summer? We testified uh, for the the governor's task force and climate action. Um, and so, as far as our work group and committee work, um, if there are opportunities where our collective voice uh, would be helpful um, in, you know educating the community, educating the local officials, um, then please, please let us know because uh, these opportunities are brought to us, but we're not aware of everything that's happening across the state. Um, and we encourage our members to um, get involved in the more voices and the uh, diversity and healthcare voices um, can really make a difference. Even in, in Rock County, where, where I live, um, I testified on a climate resolution for a county and was told by several of the county board members that they, there was a couple more yes votes than they thought there'd be. So um, I, I think we can continue to recruit members into this, into this realm, into this, into this work and empower each other and let us know when, when the opportunities present themselves because local action will push greater action at the state level too. Definitely. And, and I think it's important to understand that one of the things that healthcare providers have is we have stories. We have narratives of patients that make us concerned um, enough so that we are meeting with each other at 7.30 at night on a Tuesday evening after we put our kids to bed or, um, you know, just things that we'll reflect on from clinic that really push us to continue for these advocacy efforts. Um, the majority of what we do, um, aside from our CME conferences, we just, we just do it. We're not charging people for these things. We don't have any financial gain. We definitely have to figure out a way to make sure our executive director can stay hired because she's phenomenal. So if you want to donate, I'm not discouraging that. Um, I'm simply, I'm simply mentioning that um, you know, money is is not why we're, not why we're in this or or what we're trying to do. And people don't, I don't think people realize that health really intersects with so many other things, especially when it comes to climate change. The social determinants of health are a huge part of well-being, and so the economic viability of a town is part of health. 
Um, the direct co-benefits from climate mitigation solutions are part of that. Resiliency and climate adaptation, making sure that healthcare infrastructure is not going to be flooded or making sure that um, the, uh, the other adaptation plans or, or um, you know, things like evacuation or, or other adaptation measures, that's all part of health. Um, and much of it is within the, Dep uh, the Department of Health Services, um, certainly at the state level and to some extent on the county level as well. Um, or certainly should be more so at the county level. Um, and, you know, to, I think, Dean, you were mentioning about putting something on roofs to increase the reflectivity. I mean, that ties really well into extreme heat. And we know that in the state of Wisconsin, um, you know, extreme heat with a heat index over uh, 105 degrees is what we expect to be pretty dangerous to, uh, to the health of people who have things like heart conditions, lung conditions, kidney conditions, pregnant women, um, and their unborn children, teens, infants, elderly. There are so many people who are affected by extreme heat. And by 2050, we know that experts predict that Milwaukee, for example, will see three times as many days with a heat index of 105 degrees as a result of climate change. Um, and so being able to bring those messages about people who are affected by health into why a project like changing the way that asphalt is, um, is uh, affecting reflectivity on roofs, I mean, it's all tied together. Um, and so these initiatives dovetail so well with each other and getting that kind of healthcare support, I think really takes the, the focus off of business a little bit um, because it shouldn't all just be about, you know, um, viable business operations or, you know, what's your political motivation or what are, why are you trying to pass some kind of policy, but it really says, hey, look, it's because I care about that pregnant woman who is more likely to have preterm birth or more likely to have stillbirth, who's more likely to have a complication as a result of X, Y, and Z. Um, and this individual is working on a solution that may help to decrease the likelihood for that poor outcome in that person's health. Um, and so it really does dovetail into so much of, of what we're trying to do when it comes to renewables and adaptation and everything else. Excellent. Um, I have a, a couple questions from the chat that I want to highlight. Um, Dean is asking for those who are comfortable, if you'd like to share your contact information in the chat, um, I think some follow-up conversations might be in order. So if you have an email address you're willing to share and continue this conversation, please just put it in the chat. And then... Um, Great question here from Chris Hubbock. He's asking, um, does Wisconsin Health Professionals on Climate Action have any messaging to directly address some of the concerns that opponents cite about potential hazards of wind and solar? So I don't know if anyone wants to jump in on that. Sorry, I'm um, also getting our executive director, Abby Boyce. And then I will answer that question unless uh, Brittany or others want to jump in on answering that as well. Um, Heather, well, go ahead. Heather, I, this is Jeff. Just, just briefly while Andrew's uh, typing, or um, I think we had some kind of a sheet from Healthcare Without Harm that went into these uh, effects and why wind is good and the various pluses and minuses from different technologies. Do you still have a copy of that? Uh, Chris, that might be something that Chris could use or do you need me to get that? I do, I'll dig that out and put that in the chat. Great, and then to answer that question, so Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action um, partnered with uh, a few other groups, the, global, the UW Global Health Institute um, with Jonathan Patz and also um, I believe Dominique Broussard with the, uh, um, um, which is a, a the, do you remember the, the she, she's with um, like science communication on, at, on UW's campus. And then Ed, Ed Maybach, who is um, a pretty well-known messenger on climate and health. And we put together um, something called the medical alert and it talks about health impacts within the state of Wisconsin. It's a very Wisconsin focused um, document. There's a four page executive summary at the very beginning, which is really powerful. The whole report um, is, is pretty long. I'll see if I can get a link to that as well. Um, but that is a, a great way to kind of look at um, how climate and health are interrelated. And the reason why that's important is because you know, are there effects from wind turbines? Sure, we could talk about flicker, we could talk about um, noise levels, we can, you know, discuss, you know, if there are any merits of infrasound waves, and if that's a problem, or, you know, when it comes to solar projects, 
um, making sure that um, the land is appropriately taken care of, that there are ways of responsibly recycling some of the heavy metals and other possible environmental contaminants as, as um, things are, are no longer useful or are becoming more dilapidated. Um, there may be other things that people are concerned about, but when you compare those issues to the benefits, um, immediate co-benefits and long-term benefits of climate mitigation and adaptation, um, I mean, there's really no comparison. You say, do you want to have a wind turbine and, and solar panels, or do you want to have coal? I mean, that's a no-brainer, especially when it comes to health effects. And we have plenty of data um, to spell that out as to, why, um, as to why that's true. I will try to get a link to that medical alert. Um, and I don't know if you can see my screen right now, but I was able to pull up that fact sheet. Um, this may not be on the website that I originally got it from anymore, but this is originally from something called healthyenergyinitiative.org, a program of healthcare without harm. And this came out in 2016. Can you all see my screen okay? Okay, yeah. So basically what this is, this is a nice document that looks yes. at the public health risks of various energy solutions, the occupational health risks, which is something we definitely don't talk enough about, and then the climate risks of various um, energy solutions. And um, so I don't have a link for it, but I'm happy to, if you, you know, just let me know if you want a copy and I'll, I can email or send, put your, if you want a copy, put your email in the chat and say, let me know you want a copy. I'll email those, this out. Great. Now I went ahead and put in a link uh, that goes to the Global Health Institute's website that then has a link to that full report. Oh, um, good. Okay. With the medical alert. Um, but this, I absolutely agree with Heather that this is a, a great infographic um, showing the relative dangers of each of the different areas. Um, I think sometimes you have to make sure that the enemy of good isn't better. Um, and it doesn't mean we shouldn't come up with quality solutions, um, but it's, it's really important to, to have action now, especially when it comes to climate tipping points and, um, and thresholds. I also, this is just something else to think about when I feel like I've had questions like this asked of me, I think it's important to circle back and push on what we sort of uh, have grown accustomed to, right? So um, the garbage trucks that scroll by and the stacks that are have these big plumes just steady always. And I think um, we accept that as being our normal environment. And I think it's it's good to sometimes push on that to say, um, this doesn't have to be our current state. And do you enjoy that, right? So um, not because it's supposed to be um, a reciprocal defensive piece, but I think it's also important to just think about the new normal needs to be slightly uncomfortable from current and there needs to be a path to it but it would be silly for them to say, I actually really like hanging out by the dumpster in the backside of our hospital. Like, no, no one is gonna go back there and deep breathe. Like it's, let's not contribute to that, right? So anyway, for whatever that's worth. Yeah, I actually try to have similar conversations with a slightly different perspective, um, especially so, some one of the things I think about is not necessarily, um, to me, there are two different approaches for messaging. You can try and get places like Madison and Milwaukee to yell louder, or you can try and get um, communities who historically haven't been part of the conversation to become more engaged. Um, and as far as trying to get those um, communities that haven't considered it as much, or maybe even are, are defensive of the idea of renewables or climate mitigation and adaptation, um, I think it's really helpful to talk about it as an opportunity that they're missing out on. Um, you know, when you think about the fact, how many blockbusters are in your community now, right? When was the last time you saw Kodak film, right? There are, there are natural parts of business in general, because that's how a lot of these communities that I've engaged with like to think about things. You know, they're trying to figure out how their community can thrive. How can we attract more businesses? How can we bring this industry to our town? How can we grow our residential tax base? How can we do these other things to support our town? Um, all of which does play into the viability of, of their town and people's health. Um, I have some experience in this because I'm on our, I'm on my city's community development authority. Um, but then when you talk to them about the fact that, hey, whether you believe in climate change or not is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. The rest of the world 
is switching to renewable energy. And especially rural populations, they know that they will be the last ones involved, especially when it comes to infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so when you let those individuals know that, hey, if your, you know, 40 acre farm or your, you know, 80 acre farm, or if these individuals or this land in, in your municipality is an opportunity for growth, is an opportunity for development, is an opportunity for economic sustainability, while also helping the health of your citizens um, or, you know, the health of, of future generations to come. I think that fear of missing out along with that perspective of, of public good and integrity and honesty and like all of those values um, that I think are really shared in those rural populations can be really powerful. Um, and especially if you can couple that with healthcare messages, you know, talking about the kid who, you know, we've needed to, to up his medication dose for his asthma inhaler over and over again, based on where he lives or um, other things like that. I mean, all of those can be really powerful messages when, when put together. And so instead of it being like a pulling them along, it can sometimes be a push in the right direction. So you can say, hey, look, look at what you have to gain from this so yeah. that you don't end up like Blockbuster where you get swapped out for red boxes. Mm hmm that's a great point. Mm -hmm. um, behavior change is something that is really difficult to enact. Um, that's also kind of at the crux of what healthcare providers do on a regular basis. You know, Brittany can't, Brittany Keys, is, she introduced herself as a physical therapist. She can't force a person to do their physical therapy exercises. And so what can she do to talk to those patients to ensure that they have a treatment plan that's going to work for them and hear about their concerns and make sure they can enact those recommendations? You know, as a pediatrician, I'm not going to force a vaccine into a child's arm, um, but well, maybe against the child's wishes, but not against the parent's wishes. Um, and, uh, and so um, if someone has concerns, the ability to hear those concerns, affirm their concerns, counter those concerns, and then hopefully transform that behavior is really part of what we do in day-to-day -day operations if we're effective at our job. Um, and much of those lessons just from our day-to-day -day operations can tie into to some of the things um, that we encounter in these conversations with renewables and climate action. I have and your, a your point makes sense, Andrew. Sorry. You know, you just look at COVID and mask, mask I was just going to say just mask wearing and, and people's, um, you know, uh, motivations to go get a vaccine. They're really not motivated, a lot of them, around whether or not it's good for others in the community. And it's basically come back to selfishness and greed and, and uh, jealousy to some degree. So how can you appeal to those things? I hate to say that, but, but uh, how do you appeal to that side of it if, if people aren't going to go there from, you know, this is better for the planet or better for other people in the state or health or another community? Um, or for all of us. Uh, so I think, you know, your point is well taken that uh, maybe the messaging needs to be multifaceted to appeal to people that might not come along. And that's really why I identify with people. There have been a couple people now just within this breakout session who have talked about um, local level action. And you don't need everybody to agree on one thing. What you need is you need to have the people who are motivated to do things with their, within their community the ones who are decision makers, the one who are making things happen, we need to make sure that we understand what their concerns are and what things um, would motivate them to act on this kind of an issue. Um, and whether that's personal, whether that's a, a public issue, um, th those are things that in many ways have to happen within conversation. Um, but when, when we see these things start to happen, then all of a sudden you start to hear about, you know, the farmer who's renting his land out for twice as much to this, you know, solar or wind developer than they are to, you know, what they would have done to have it farmed by another farmer or for livestock grazing or something like that. And then when they see it, then it's more personal, it's more actionable, and then that sentiment can grow. Um, but without having those multiple seeds planted around the state or across the country, um, it's really hard for that buy-in to occur. Um, state action through the governor's task force on climate change. Yeah, it's great that we have a starting point. It's great that we have a, a place that things are moving at a state level and some state support and office of sustainability and clean energy with Maria Redmond. All of these things are great um, to have that um, state support to some extent. Um, but we know without those local commitments, which have to be formed from local values and, and local impact, I just don't see how much is going to move forward too much. 
And I would comment on um, uh, with, with what Jeff said on um, trying to appeal to the best, better for the greater good is if you can relate it to the individual or the individual's experience. I know there's been um, presenters talking about how different parts of the state have experienced devastating floods. And, you know, you can always draw and that has spurred um, people towards more action. Um, another thing that I just want to uh, say following Andrew's comments and on um, getting involved at the local level is there's a very diverse group here that brings um, a lot of different perspectives, which is very exciting to me. And as um, <clears throat> a local elected official, um, I want to empower everyone to reach out to their own representatives um, whenever opportunities, especially regarding well, whatever is important to you, but with uh, clean energy initiatives as well, um, big ships move slow. And the bigger the ship, it seems like the slower it moves and the more barriers, right? But um, and, and you may not see immediate action, you may not get a response, and it may seem frustrating, but really um, every time you reach out to those people who are elected and empowered in those decision-making positions, it, it does make a difference, and persistence pays off. So um, especially if there's a bigger project that's, that's coming up, um, if you get a, a diverse group of people supporting it and why and those personal stories and you personalize it and why it's important to you and your community, it can really have um, a lot of power. Yeah, you know what I um so I've been talking about climate and health and every well child check that I have as a pediatrician for the last year. Um, and just and my message is about 45 seconds long. And I just tell people, you know, in the last two years, the American Academy of Pediatrics and over 150 health organizations around the country declared climate change a health emergency. Um, it's estimated that 64,000 premature deaths occurred in the United States in 2016 just due to air pollution. And we know that worsening air quality is only one out of nine ways that climate change is harming people. Um, it disproportionately harms children, which is why I'm talking about it in my clinic. And so just like we want you to wear your seat belt, have your kids wear their seat belts and eat healthy foods and do other things to improve health, um, that if there are ways that you can support clean energy initiatives or change your own energy use so that you can reduce your energy, um, overall energy burden or um, become more energy efficient, that that's also a way to improve your, your children's health as well. Um, and within the last month, I actually started to measure people's responses to that. And so let me see, because it's been really interesting. I only have 67 survey respondents so far. Um, but let me see if I can share my screen. Can everyone see this okay? That looks great. All right. So here is what I have so far. This is not published. So take that for what it is. But select the best, the choice that best describes you. Patient, meaning the child, because remember, I'm a pediatrician. Parent of the patient is the primary respondent. Caregiver of the patient. Um, this is multiple people answering as a family. So you can see most of the time, it's the parent of the patient who's filling out the survey. Prior to your visit, were you aware of any climate change related health harms? Honestly, I was shocked about this, that 55 people um, out of the 66 respondents said that they already knew of some climate change related health harms. Um, as a result of your visit today, in my 45 second spiel that I just told you, have you learned more about climate change related health harms? And even though 60, uh, even though, what is it, 83% said they knew about it, 90% said they learned more just from that 45 second spiel. How likely are you to support clean energy initiatives as a result of counseling given by your healthcare provider today? Very likely, likely, neither likely, nor unlikely, unlikely, or very unlikely. You can see as a result of that counseling, no one said that they were unlikely to do nothing when it comes to supporting clean energy initiatives. Like that's, and, and just for context, it is very clearly explained that this is not a patient satisfaction survey, that the way that they respond to this is completely anonymous. I'm not in the room or my back is turned and I'm doing the physical exam with kids. Um, if they choose to do it when I'm still in the room. So these are completely anonymous, um, but that's pretty impressive to me. Um, how likely are you to save energy as a result of the counseling given by your healthcare provider? Very likely, likely, neither likely nor unlikely. Again, nobody said unlikely or very unlikely as a result of the counseling. And then I also thought it was important to ask about political leanings. I work on the east side of Madison. Um, and so in general, you think of yourself as very liberal, somewhat liberal, moderate, middle of the road, somewhat conservative, very conservative. 
Um, so you can see, obviously, Madison is a, a more liberal town, but even with um, moderates, somewhat conservative and conservatives being, you know, what is that close to 40 percent? The fact that people said that they were more likely to do things and I can filter things. So if I filter just the conservative responses, which is arguably not statistically significant, right? I have three responses from the very conservative group. Um, they said um, that they were less likely to be aware of things. They learned more. They were very likely to support clean energy initiatives as a result of counseling. Neither likely nor unlikely was one of the respondents. Very likely to try to save energy and likely was the other one. Um, and so it's not completely party line. If I filter by somewhat conservative, um, now we have only five. Well, Andrew, while you're doing it, I mean, are you looking to, what was that? I'm just curious, are you looking to proliferate this? Through, through, I was just curious if you're looking to proliferate this uh, through the health systems of the state, uh, maybe, you know, your, your colleagues and uh, other pediatricians, uh, doing a similar type of thing, or if you can find those that are, uh, you know, interested in this topic, um, so, this is a way of changing minds. You know, yeah, one there, on one. there definitely a fleet, is, fleet of people communicating like you are. Yeah, there definitely is a group of pediatricians who are looking at how can we get um, healthcare care, how can we get pediatricians to talk about climate change in their clinic, and then also receive maintenance of certification credits. We all have credits we need to get to keep our board certification. And so they would be able to do this and get board certification credits at the same time. Um, and so I actually started to do this partly because I already was counseling. And so asking people to take a survey that I've developed isn't too hard. And then it does hopefully bolster those attempts to get other people to talk about things as well. Um, so in general, the answer is yes, eventually we would like this kind of information to be shared more widely. Um, obviously with, uh, I'm trying to get more conservative responses um, so that the power of the survey is, is better. Power, I mean like statistical power, not like the power, um, maybe a little bit of both. Um, but so the statistical power is a little bit better. Um, and I'll just kind of scroll through the somewhat conservative. You can see um, the somewhat conservative, people identifying as somewhat conservative were 60% um, were unaware of climate related health harms. Um, four out of the five said they learned more. Um, and that side of things, they uh, looks like 40% of them. Um, but this is like 60% of those respondents within the somewhat conservative group. We haven't even looked at the liberal, very liberal or moderates. So, I mean, you can see that this message cross cuts, um, cross cuts political boundaries. Um, obviously, the responses in the, obviously the responses in the, um, in the liberal and the very liberal crowd, you're going to see so much more support um, because of it being a partisan issue in the past. Um, but even on, among the the controversial crowds or the ones that we sometimes see as the enemy within the the climate advocacy groups, I mean, even they're very responsive to healthcare message. Um, and I think it also speaks to some, it being personal too, when it's someone that you know and trust, right? They've been bringing their kids to me. So I'm talking to them about vaccines and their health and all these other things. And I bring up climate change because I think it's important. And so how can we get those trusted messengers? Um, like it was alluded to earlier. I forgot who made that point earlier. How can we get those trusted messengers to tell people like, it's time to stop debating climate change and time to start debating how you want to enact the solution and what's the best way for your community. Andrew, that brings up a good point. I mean, you probably have a private service that you run, right? You're not part of, are you part of a hospital affiliation? I'm part of a small HMO. Okay. So going to someone like <clears throat> uh, Mayo Clinic or going to someone to Marshfield Clinic or Aurora or wherever, um, going to the gatekeepers and and what kind of, uh, just, a, just a question from a legality standpoint, I guess is, can you do a, do a survey like that? My wife being in the uh, family health, uh, labor and delivery area with Marshfield, I would love to, you know, with my business being solar and being uh, the sustainability products that I have, I would love to do something like that to then take that to the gatekeepers of the, the politicians of the hospital per se, or the owners or the nurses or the, the nuns, whoever I need to talk to. Um, but what are the legalities of something like that? Running a survey in a in a clinic that would be, you know, a bigger entity. So I think every healthcare system is going to be different. Every clinic is going to be different. I have a 
pretty good amount of autonomy and I'm trying to be aware of time as well. Um, but I think the best thing would be to reach out to the healthcare company that you're interested in affecting a change, see what commitments they already have to clean energy. Um, if they're part of healthcare without harm, if they're part of practice green health, if they're part of some of these organizations already that support sustainability, your lift might not be as much. Um, sometimes getting your foot in the door involves making sure that you talk to a board or talk to an executive team or talk to um, whomever about the importance of having a sustainability committee or the importance, importance of increasing sustainable operations. Um, and we definitely have individuals as part of Wisconsin Health Professionals for Climate Action who can help craft that messaging. Um, we can certainly give the presentation as well, but it's always best to hear it from the employee um, rather than having someone else come in. Um, but we can help with that too. Um, but I, I would say the answer is certainly yes. Um, it just depends on what hoops each healthcare system requires you to go through to do that. For me, it was pretty easy. I mean, everything can be under quality improvement and we all need to do quality improvement as part of our practices. Perfect, thanks for that. Um, Kim Griffin in the chat said, thank you so much for doing this. It's incredibly important that people hear this from the healthcare sector and let me just echo that we're at we're at time so if people drop off that's okay but i just want to say wow andrew boy you dropped the mic with the data set i mean that is fantastic information um so i'm just so excited for everything whpca is doing and really all the healthcare folks on this call and the people interested in how the intersection of health and renewable energy i think it's true there are no the, mess the messaging on this and the, you being messengers on this is extremely compelling as your raw local data shows. So it's just really, really exciting to see that. Well, and remember it's 67 respondents. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully things will become more statistically significant. <laughs> not a peer reviewed study, I totally understand, but the numbers are very interesting. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. And again, please reach out to us um, at our emails. You can always go to our website um, to, to get in touch with any of the people on our board or through our membership. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. And Andrew, I um, did a cut and paste and I'm saving the whole chat so we can follow up with folks. Awesome, thank you. I was having a hard time keeping track on all of it, so I appreciate you guys jumping in. I'll, um, I'll add, thanks for uh, sharing a lot of that information, folks. Um, and I can also relate, my wife has got a PT, is a PT here in <laughs> Madison. So you guys, doctors and PTs, man, you're more psychologists sometimes than anything. So those conversations do spark up. Um, Maybe two other points. I, I think a lot of stuff is going on, you know, trying to engage other people. I know, you know, county climate action plans are out and about. I'm sure we're looking at some of those. And um, in terms of that conservative versus liberal point of view, you know, I think reaching out across the aisle to the Wisconsin Conservative Forum, that group. Conservative Energy Forum, yeah. Conservative Energy Forum. Um, they've done some other studies on how to, present the message to different different groups too. Um, talking maybe more about security mm -hmm. and, and security, how that, so who, who you're talking to and who you know, so. Um. You know, they, they have some, they're doing some uh, Facebook messaging um, in various counties around Wisconsin right now. And they're talking about, um, yeah, like really using uh, traditionally conservative um, message points, family values energy independence and security, property rights, which is very interesting. M military security, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly, national security. Fascinating stuff. So, so. Thanks for the time, guys. Really yeah, of course. Great. Nice to meet you. Keep, up, Thank keep you. up all the good work there. You Thank too. You. Thanks. Thank you, Heather. Good job, Andrew. Thank you, Morgan. <laughs> that survey was amazing. <laughs> Sorry. No, no those are published. There. Once you get the power, you're going to publish. Once it. I have the statistical power, I will. Uh, I will be happy to share it. Um, that, and well, I think amazing. a lot of the people here today would be very interested in it. And I loved how such a diverse group 
um, like solar installers, you know, and, and more on the business side, we're here and intrigued. And I'm just saying for, they could be almost like a guest for direct access or, you know, or direct action or, um, I don't know. I feel like there's future partnership with more that group too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. absolutely. I'm Climate so, solutions are health solutions, right? Yeah. I'm oh. so glad you guys did this session because the 45 minutes was not enough. Like this getting into the details here is so interesting. Yeah. I'm glad that we had, <laughs> at first I was a little nervous. I was like, oh no, it's like Jeff Rich and Jeff Thompson and all, I and know. Kate Quickman. And I'm like, I'm, it's, it's nice to see familiar names. Um, but at the same time, I'm glad we also got some other individuals from like in the industry and, and those sides of things because they, people don't think that they dovetail and they dovetail so well and, and they support everything that those individuals are doing. Um, and, and you, you know, you know, the messenger role is powerful when you have the state journal reporter here. You yeah. know, the, he wasn't in the other sessions, he was here, right? So that's yeah. <laughs> because this is the story that people want to read about. So, I mean, it's just it's really, really cool. Well, and I also think it's kind of new, right? I mean, yeah. people don't think about climate change in healthcare. People hear climate change and you expect that WPR is going to talk about environmental groups. Yep. Not healthcare groups. Yep. You know, it's seen as an environmental issue rather than a health issue. It's not necessarily a human issue. And I know that that's slowly changing because I don't want to diminish the efforts of all of the other individuals, you know, who've been working on climate and health for, you know, the last couple decades. Um, but it's been a, a long time coming. And now to have, especially the U.S. call to action on climate, health and equity mm -hmm. um, with uh, over 150 signers, including huge groups you know, like the American Medical Association, American Public Health Association, and all of the other, you know, alphabet soup that are big names. I mean, people know the American Heart Association. People yes, care. Yes, and the about, American Lung Association. The Lung Very Association. Powerful. And, Very powerful. And, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American yeah. Academy of Family Practitioners, like those are important names to individuals. And when you can say, these are groups that have signed on to the fact that climate change is a health emergency, it's like, oh boy, these big organizations said that they would sign on to, the, to this like because people always think about like oh they don't want to be taboo you don't want to yeah. be like mm, like yeah. it is a formidable it's a formidable message you know the other thing that this really reminds me of is you know i used to work for the city of madison and um uh we were always talking about you know who do people listen to in their local government um and i, I looked at data that said you know when you're dealing with school issues you know people people get upset about the public school system but they love their teacher right. and i think that's a lot like right. the role you all play is is the individual they enter, actually interact with or the type of individual they inter, actually interact with in the healthcare system they love you guys because like you provide them a service you help them when they need it so even if even if they hate the entire system they love you and that that's a really powerful role to play yeah. If anyone um, ever tells me they like U.S. healthcare, I'm going to be a little shocked. <laughs>